um, three brothers that started the farm or bought out their, their father. One brother stayed there and managed the farm, had been working on the farm since 1976, and he, he had graduated from K-State. One brother was working for Arthur Anderson, um, and then the other one was with uh, John Deere Tractor Works, and had spent his entire life being an engineer for John Deere. So if you have a, a John Deere tractor, uh, you have him to think partly for that, or you have him to cuss, whichever way you want to participate in that discussion. Um, Anyway, all the siblings, or grand, or sons, daughters, whatever, all went off and got different jobs. And as part of their transition plan, they went looking for someone outside of the family. And uh, I'm, I'm that one, either either good or bad. It depends on the day, as you can imagine. But uh, anyway, the I I started working for them in 2003. I bought into the partnership in 1990 or 2006. And then uh, in 2008, the, the brother that was with Arthur Anderson, he spent most of his latter part of his life being in Lagos, Nigeria, doing some venture capital work. Um, he brought in his two sons as partners. And so currently I have three Harvard MBAs that I deal with. Um, and then uh, Jim is, the, is a partner that lives there in Hugoton. Dick is 80 years old and he thinks 20 years, 30 years, 40 years in the future. Very progressive, very um, forward thinker, and he's, he's hard to put up with because he asks some real stupid questions sometimes. But uh, they're questions like, why are you doing, the way, doing it the way you're doing it? So he's been very ben beneficial, and uh, I don't think I ever could have afforded the education I've gotten from, I've received from working with him and his two sons. But uh, that's a little history about where, where, who we are, I guess. In uh, 2008, we bought our first Xactric systems, our, our first Xactric system and installed it on a DMI toolbar. And like I said, I'd, I'd farmed with my dad and brother. I'd been on that farm for 25 years, 27 years. And I uh, was moving cattle with my brother one day and we was driving them across the corn patch and there was corn on the hilltops. And all the years of doing that, we'd never had any corn. So I asked him, what, do you, what, what happened here? What are you doing different? Well, he was started out using an exactric system and it cut his nitrogen rates back. Suddenly had corn on the hilltops. Well, suddenly he started buying some equipment. Through some of his trial and error with exactrics and experience with it, it got me onto it. And so I've benefited from some of his experience and later on when we talk about our, our yield um, data from our, or our nitrogen plot, I started where I started because some of the things that he had learned with his system. We are a uh, farm about 4,200 acres, center pivot irrigate about 3,800. Um, I pump water from the Ogallala Aquifer anywhere from 160 to 240 feet deep is to the uh, surface water or to the top of the water. Most of our wells are 600 feet deep. We're uh, about 50% corn, 30% wheat, 20% varies between cotton and sunflowers, confection sunflowers. Um, I haul all my corn to seaboard and ends up going into pigs, so eat lots of pork and uh, eat David sunflower seeds would be, I guess, what I'd tell you today too. Um, like I did say, our soils are sandy, sandy loam. Um, we do have a certified seed wheat business that I manage on top of the farm. Um, we do all this with myself and three full-time employees. And uh, luck luckily enough, once in a while I get some high school help and uh, help them out through the summer. But we put about 100,000 bushels through that certified seed wheat business. And uh, of course, you can imagine sometimes that's really good and sometimes that's not, not real great. But uh, over the history, it's, it's been a beneficial investment. That started back in 1976. Prior to our Xactrix experience, we was 100% liquid. Jim had started that program back in 1976 when he first came back to the farm. 
said, I started, a, got our first Xactric system in 2008. We installed that on a 5310 uh, 30 foot DMI bar on 30 inch centers. And I started my first series of test plots using the ortho ratio. Um, it was a ratio between my nutrients. And then I, in 2010, we bought a Coulter bar. I did some phosphorus plots and then I did another set of nitrogen plots. And we also played around with wheat. There's my nitrogen rates, or my fertility rates that we started with on those seven plots. Randomized that four times. And what I did that is I just put all my rep one, or yeah, rep one, rep two, I put them in a hat and drew them out. That was the first one. Drew the second one out, that was the, sec the second one, and so on and so forth. Half mile long on a center pivot. And we did those I did that plot for three years and I put the same plot year after year after year. So um, the 25N 11P 6S was in the same spot for three years. Half mile long pivots, we took soil tests the first of December every year before we started the plot and then each year thereafter. And uh, we weighed the corn every year on a weigh wagon. That's what started the transition of asking myself was how do we measure? I mean, what's your metric? What, what do you use to measure success? Um, my partner that lives in Hugoton, he's 74. He spends a significant amount of time in a coffee shop. There's good parts and there's bad parts to that. Um, he, does, he does very little on the farm. He spends most of the time in the office. Helps me out a tremendous amount in the seed wheat business. Um, that's really his first love, I think. So he uh, spends most of his time with that. But he hears stories talking about, well, I had 280 bushel corn this year. Well, he asked me, how come we're not raising 280 bushel corn? <laughs> Well, there's a lot of different variables to go into raising 200 bushel corn. Different soil types, different water. Um, we are limited in the amount of water we can pump from the Ogallala. I've got wells that I can pump only 15 inches, and I've got some that I can pump 24. So, you know, there's a difference. It's not supplemental irrigation. Um, we get about 17 inches of rainfall in a normal year, and I think the last time we had a normal year was 2003. <laughs> Uh, last three years, we've probably had a combined rainfall of less than 12. Combined. Combined. So, uh, it's, it's been difficult. Um, so anyway, what's your metric? What do you use? Do you talk bushels per acre or you talk dollars per acre? We started out talking bushels per acre. And I've changed where I could care less about bushels. It's dollars that matter. It's dollars that make my banker happy. It's dollars that make my wife happy. And believe it or not, it's dollars that make my partnership happy. If I raise 280 bushel corn and I lose money, my partner that's in Lagos, Nigeria is pissed. <laughs> if I make $240 an acre, he's pissed. Because now he's got to pay more taxes. <laughs> you know? I can handle, I can solve that problem. We can work on that. So these are my bushels per acre average for the 2008, 9, and 10. The handout that you've got is just the 2008 results. So my question is which application rate should I use going forward? Well, with the old mindset of talking bushels per acre, is that the answer that everyone would give? Yeah. I'll back up just a little bit, and you can see I've got a, a range of 25 pounds if in, all the way up to 190. And I, I jumped that. And these are all in the ortho ratio. And I started out that low because some of Joel's plots had shown a 
the most profitable area for fertilization for the year or two that he did it was in that 50 to 80 pounds of in range. He farmed some nasty ground. <laughs> nasty ground. And uh, the wells aren't quite as big. And so I started with that. And I went higher than what Guy wanted me to, I think, initially. But I wanted to get to the other side of the curve. I wanted to see when it started to drop off. And I'm talking dollars, not bushels. <coughs> so there it is in the dollars per acre. That's gross dollars per acre. And that my fertilizer cost. And that's using an average of corn price of, I think it was $3.91 for the three-year average. So that's where we were at when we were looking at bushels per acre. But that's where I'm at on net dollars per acre. With the 190 pounds in, I have a whole lot more dollars at risk per acre every year. But it costs me almost $12 an acre to get that extra six bushels. I went backwards. I was operating on the back side of the curve. So, going forward, this is kind of where I have tried to stay. And I say try, because I've fallen off the wagon. And we've pushed application rates up to that. And it was a mistake. So you got to recalibrate yourself and come back to home base. Now, I have had fields that I've cut 270 bushel when Mother Nature cooperated and we had rains in June, cool weather in August. This also includes the 2008 plot that um, we lost. And I, I don't remember exactly what my hail insurance adjustment was on that, but it was 25-30% um, loss to hail. So then I started just kind of playing around with my neighbors because, you know, you, you, they see this. I don't, do you guys have neighbors that drive by? Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask that, that. So that fertility program, is, there was no other dry uh, supply. That was it. That was it. All placed strip till. So it was strictly a, a nitrogen, potassium, sulfur. Okay. Yep. No, phosphate. Phosphate. Or phosphate. I didn't have any it, potassium it, applied. The, you notice the P rates are uh, a little higher than what we normally see. <laughs> That's because on the Malik, they're about a 5 ppm, very low on P. Yeah. And phosphate was recently uh, priced uh, when you did those uh, plots. So he did the ortho ratio, which is 27.12.07s, and then you just multiply it out, and you can see that, uh, you know, it's economics that Ben is chasing. It's not, he's not really chasing in, he's, he's raising P and S at the same time. So that S is ammonium thiol sulfate, uh, is 39S, and then 67P uh, would be 1034O. And then, of course, um, most of the N was NH3. So um, in the overall effect of it and this approach, it was economics at the time. Now, today, Ben would not be applying at these higher P and S rates. Is that right, Bill? Yeah, I'm going to You're going to go almost quiet. almost finish there, not quite. But. I guess, my, you know, you had mentioned how sandy your ground was, and typically no sand. I live in northeast Nebraska, I and mean, we got on that kind of sand, and I'm really going to sound like the guy selling liquid potash fertilizer, right? But I was just surprised that you wouldn't be applying any potassium at those, on those My potassium is actually is, is um, pretty good for the most part. Is it? Yeah. Very seldom. I've got I've got some some of that nasty ground that recommends to apply P or K, but uh, on the bulk of the farm, we're high enough that they don't recommend. You do use we're changing. Yes, we've changed that a little bit, and I'll I'll touch on that here in just a little bit. 
So, um, and I'll, I'll touch on this a little later too. We did soil tests every year after all this, and you'd think that on these low rates, pulling off those kind of bushels, that uh, my nitrogen and phosphorus levels would decline, right? That's what I thought. It didn't. Um, there was very little difference in my nitrogen soil test between this rate and these low rates. My P rate when it was a little higher between the, the high rate because we were building, we were putting more P in than what we were taking off. But the the soil tests from year to year were fairly stable. Is my point. But I have neighbors that drive by and they, they watch me like a hawk, especially since we started in 2008. What's this Xactrix? Never heard of it. And talk about it and they'd say, ah, oh, it's just, you're out of your mind. There's no way you can do that. Well, you know, when you're driving the combine and the other guy's driving the combine on their side of the road and you kind of count the trucks that come off of it. And <laughs> <laughs> we sent more trucks to town than they did. And the next year they say, did you really do that? Did you, is that all you nitrogen applied? Yeah. What are you not telling me? <laughs> I'm telling you everything I know. No, there's no way. There's no way. And so, um, I have a producer. He's a real good friend of mine. My wife works for him. And uh, he still thinks I'm out of my mind, but that's okay. I'll be farming his ground one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I put in, uh, compared my DMI with Xactrix versus his DMI using the Raven cold flow system with the normal shank you're going to get that's got your anhydrous ammonia going in front and your liquid coming out the tube at the back above it, right? Instead of the Xactrix having those things switched around, uh, streaming flow injection, liquid anhydrous. Are you guys all familiar with that concept? I mean, there's some really good pictures in the book there. And, um, so there's a difference in knives there. But anyway, my comparison was basically comparing the Xactrix versus the Raven Cold Flow. Same fertilizer. I get a little air right there. But uh, pumped the liquid fertilizer out of my tank, pumped it right into his tank. Had 24 rows of the Xactrix rep uh, in the middle. Had this application on one side. And then I said, how many pounds of nitrogen are you applying on your corn? He says, 240 pounds. Go on the other side of where I applied it and crank it up. Let's just get this done. So we've got 24 rows, 24 rows, and 24 rows. Just comparing the same, night, the same fertility application, I had an 18 bushel yield advantage with the Xactrix using the average for that year price of three ninety one at Hugoton, I put seventy dollars and thirty eight cents in my pocket. Spending the exact same money. And then I compare what I was doing to what he was doing. Same field, same water, side by side, twenty four rows. With the Raven cold flow, there was a 2.3 bushel advantage. It costs an extra $41 of fertilizer. Take my cost of fertilizer less the $2.31, or 2.3 2 bushels at $3.91. It costs $32 an acre to get that 2.3 bushel. So if we left off that, bottom two rows, you'd probably want to have the 2.3 bushel. But it's dollars that matter. I don't care about the bushels. They're nice to talk about. My banker don't understand them. Some of my partners don't understand them, but by golly, they understand dollars. So 
So that was my experience with corn. We bought this Burgo toolbar, coulter bar. The idea was going to side dress corn. We was also doing double crop sunflowers behind wheat. Needed a way to put some extra fertilizer on those sunflowers. And then, we, well, we're going to side dress our wheat. Heard guy talk about it. Heard some other guys do about it. Do it up north. And uh, thought we'd want to try it. We went out. First application, there was about an inch of snow on the ground. Made really cool pictures. I have no idea where they're at. <laughs> but about three days before the snow came, a seismograph crew came out and laid cables all across this quarter of ground. And we went through there and we made 15-inch uh, pieces of wire. <laughs> We had an interesting discussion with that one, and I, I'm not really, ever, nobody was happy when we were all done with it, but uh, I was happier than the seismograph crew, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm still picking up wire. But anyway, we, uh, we had been side dressing, or top dressing our wheat 32% in, or 32 percent. Typically in southwest Kansas, guys will go out there and we'll put 32 percent with Allen and 2,4-D and the first part of March and so that's what we did well I split I uh, started out the first year we did it I, we just did a, a round in the middle and did uh, application on both sides with the 32 percent and I had about 90 percent hail loss on that field that year but we went out and harvested it anyway there was a three bushel yield advantage where I had done the taps the exactrix application. The whole field averaged four bushel an acre. <laughs> but there was a three bushel an acre to the exactrix. Next year we split the field because I couldn't give up that many dollars per acre. So I, I did all of, all of the farm with exactrix but I left one quarter that we, uh, we split and put 32 percent on it. And I can promise you, if you're in wheat, I will promise you three bushel. You can take that to the bank every year. So you get more bushels, less cost. We were using those Burgo openers, and the, the Mustangs are a huge improvement over the Burgos. We've made some adjustments to them where they're working. and. Uh, I'm paying down debt instead of buying new equipment, so that's why I don't have a set of Mustangs. But uh, I have learned that uh, whenever we run across the wheat with those Burgos, I crank the pivot up and put a half inch of water on to help settle the dirt back down and give me peace of mind because it, they do throw a lot of dirt. And uh, it just kind of makes you feel better when the wheat looks good rather than being having a little dirt on it. But, uh, so my question I, for me, I guess, is where do I go from here? Looking at 2015, um, Tina did a great job. And I'm glad to know that there's, I wasn't just out there on, by myself, I guess, or thinking, what, what am I going to do for 2015? How can I cut costs and those things? And I look around where my other producers are at, my friends, my, my neighbors, and, uh, you know, what are they going to do? And... I know when I was going through my balance sheets, when I get home, I've got to go meet with a banker to get our loan renewed for this next year. And we were having this discussion in, in the office the other day is, is what's, what, what is our largest, single largest expense? I'm all cash rent, so cash rent's my largest expense. But right behind that's fertilizer. And it makes a whole lot more sense to, well, if you're going to make a difference in your budget, are you going to cut costs on your largest expense that makes up 23% of your costs? Or are you going to cut on your consulting bill or something that's 1%? Unless you're the federal government. 
I think you're going to look at that single largest expense item to cut, to cut costs. You can do some things with your seed. You can do some things with um, maybe your herbicide program, but fertilizer looks like it's an easy pickings one for me from where I've, where I've come from. Uh, these are prices at Hugoton as of Monday. 32 percent was 335. That's a dollars per pound of N. Urea dollars per pound of N. Ammonia dollars per pound of N. A couple weeks before, I was having a conversation with my fertilizer guy, and he says, "Well, a lot of people are going to liquid and dry because there's just not much difference in nitrogen expense." Huh. Huh. Call guy. I said, Guess what? Guy says, huh. <laughs> you're not buying any fertilizer from that idiot, are you? <laughs> well, yeah, I probably will, but not very much. Uh, okay. So anyway, that's where we start with. And I wanted to t compare maybe what a traditional <coughs> crop quest type recommendation would be versus a Ben McClure recommendation. A lot of guys in my area are exceeding 280 pounds of in, expecting a 200, maybe 220 bushel corn crop. So that's your dollars per acre for 32%, your dollars per acre for urea, dollars per acre for ammonia. If you're all liquid program using 10340, that's dollars per pound of P, there's no nitrogen credit there. Down here at the bottom line, there's your, your uh, liquid program, there's your anhydrous program, dry program. Fertilizer dealer tells me that a lot of guys are going to drink liquid and dry just because there's not much difference in nitrogen costs. Hmm. For what I'm going to do, I'm putting 140 pounds of nitrogen out as anhydrous ammonia. I'm putting 35 pounds of P out there and then I'm throwing in this thiosol. Guy likes to call it the George Blanda of fertilizers, triple threat. Provides some nutrients but it's also a nitrogen stabilizer that I get a benefit for some other nutrients. And frees up micronutrients. That's right. A pH shift, a very exclusive factor that many don't take into account is the pH shift because the ammonia drives a high pH and there are a certain amount of micronutrients that are available at a higher pH. You've seen that little chart. Yep. And then as it begins to oxidize over time, it does that shift under seven and then brings up the second set of micronutrients. Very It happened. That's why I came here. <laughs> Five minutes. All right, great. So this is where I'm at with my total fertility program. This is where I would be at if I was still working in 2005, 2006, 2007. I have about 2,000 acres of corn. Saving 90 bucks an acre gives me a lot of money I can do some other things with. Pays for my exactric system in the first thousand acres that I go over. Oh, wait a minute, I paid for that back in 2008. Huh. It's almost, it's like a tragedy. You know, you just can't believe why did this work so good? But most pieces of technology appear to be magical. They just... Wow, it's amazing. It happen? <laughs> but it's the uniformity of the application. So a pound of peas is a pound of B when it's in the tank. And the agronomist will come up and tell you this, you know, there's no difference in phosphate. Oh, yes, there is. But it's up to the producer to make the difference. So the process is the key. Uniformity, crystallization, knowing 
triple superammoniate, the phosphate, along with the, and then the thiosol is in there to stabilize the band, to keep the bacteria at bay, and then the ammoniated zinc is low cost zinc, which is critical in these drier areas at high pH. So you need zinc in there, not chelated zinc, ammoniated zinc, and that's worth about five, six, maybe ten bucks an acre. And in a dry program, it's almost impossible to get a zinc response. You have to go up on the economic side, way up there, ten pounds of bay zinc or something like that. So as you begin to understand how does all this happen, well, it was really all planned out in the late 70s and 80s by the Tennessee Valley Authority. And they began to understand if you could do this uniformly, then you would reduce the nutrient requirement. You'd make it more crop available. Mm -hmm. Well, we also saw it in the Pacific <coughs> Northwest because there was aqua ammonia. Aqua ammonia is like 20% nitrogen. <coughs> and it comes out in a liquid streaming flow. So all it is is ammonia-saturated water. And with the yielder drills, we would set our yielders with aqua ammonia. We'd set them at 80 pounds in, and oh, we've got the ammonia drill over there. Well, we'll set it at 120. Because the ammonia drill was not, it was an old Raven system with those little water flow meters in them, you know, and coolers. Port, we were dropping the ammonia knowing that we just had to put on more. So if you've got to get a lot of acres done, you don't mess with aqua ammonia. It's not a practical material. Yeah. So the thinking was in the eventualities, maybe someday we can figure out how to make ammonia work just as good as aqua ammonia. And that is the promise. And the discovery didn't occur until almost 10, 15 years later, how to do it. And when it was discovered, well, all the cars start. It does work. You raise the pressure, inject it as a liquid through a terminal orifice, and then it's going to run like aqua ammonia. You don't have to pack all that weight of aqua, and it doesn't splash everywhere. So it became an opener, cool opener approach. Little history there, Ben. So um, the, these returns, by the way, you'll see this everywhere you go. Uh, on the irrigated production, it's somewhere around a $90 per acre advantage. And you have approached it correctly. It's about dollars. It's not about yield. And uh, you just get better and better. OK. So I talked about the Farm Bill, our government. This time last week, I was at the Kansas Farm Bureau's annual convention. And Mary Kay Thatcher is our lobbyist in DC for the AFBF. And uh, she tells us the next round of farm bill negotiation, what's the low-hanging fruit? Crop insurance. How many of you know the percentage of the U.S. budget that the farm bill makes up? It's about 1% of the total U.S. budget is wrapped up in that farm bill. What percentage of the farm bill is nutrition? About 80 percent, at least 20 percent to go to for the crop insurance commodity programs. Crop insurance makes up a small part of that. They're going after something that's less than one percent of the U.S. budget. Does that make sense? Sure it does. It does in Washington, <laughs> but it doesn't on my farm. You know, I can tell Jim he can't have his candy bars at noon. And I cut a little bit out of his family living expenses, don't I? Maybe I tell my employees, you know, you can't take the farm pickup home anymore. You've got to provide your own transportation to work. I can cut some expenses there. Is it going to make a difference? Yeah, I'll probably have a pissed off housewife somewhere because now their money's going towards buying a, providing transportation for them to work. But in the grand scheme of, of my farm, it's almost insignificant. But I can make a difference on those things that I do control. Now I want to touch on my soil test results from 2007 and 2014. In 2007, my, my average uh, soil nitrate, nitrogen levels was in the low teens. 
My P levels was in the 20s. You'd think that my nitrogen levels would go down since I've been applying a lot less nitrogen. My P levels would maybe stay the same. My nitrogen levels are still in the teens, maybe the high teens, because my organic matter has gone up as we've switched from an intensive tillage to no-till, minimum till, uh, strip till type environment. My P levels have climbed where I'm in the, in the high 30s now. My APH has gone up every year, every year, even when we had severe hail. And I'm talking my uh, average across the whole farm. But here's where it hits home for me, is that in 1986, when those brothers started farming, they put in $100,000. That's money they injected into the farm to buy out their dad buy equipment from him and capitalize it so that they had very little debt. But they had a net worth of about $100,000. In 2003, when I started uh, working for them, they had a, a net worth of about $500,000. But their changed net worth, or earned net worth, had a minus in front of that. So from 1986 to 2003, they'd lost basically a million dollars. They had a net worth because they had injected capital. You remember me telling you about that brother that worked in Lagos, Nigeria for Arthur Anderson? In 1986, he had an equal share of that farm. In 2003, he owned over 75% of it because he injected money in exchange for ownership of the farm. 2006, when I became a partner, um, the net worth was uh, about $750,000. Today our net worth is up over a million dollars. Our earned, I'm talking earned net worth, is up over two million dollars. In that amount of time I've bought did you say, what was it? It was over a million or two million? Over two million. It went from 750 to two million. In eight years. I've put in 200,000 bushels of grain storage. I've put in two uh, 18,000 gallon anhydrous ammonia tank storage. I've bought seven, eight nurse trailers. And this is all farming the same land. We didn't expand, we didn't farm more acres. Um, it's basically the exact same ground that they started with back in 1986. And it all comes back to that $90 an acre. There's a few slides back that I've been able to put in my pocket every year. So for me, Exactrix has changed the rules of the game. Not only, I mean, I, I guess this, this came to me last night or a couple nights ago about you know, I, I now have a def an offense and a defense. You know, they're just watching the NFL game or maybe it was K-State getting whooped up on by TCU. Made me think about that maybe, but, um, you know, we're all great marketers, right? We all market corn at the high for the year. We're all the best producers in our county. So we know how to sell it, we know how to grow it. But who's watching our bottom line? Is my fertilizer dealer looking out for me when he's telling me I need to be growing, uh, using 32% in urea? He's just trying to make a sale, trying to feed his family. I can't fault him for that. Maybe for some people that works, you know, maybe not. Um, my banker, he probably wants me to stay in business every year, but he likes to borrow have a good borrowing portfolio and lend me money so that they make more interest, right? My John Deere dealer, does he have my best interest at heart? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my brother-in-law works there. Love him. And I want his kids to eat well. I want him to go to college, but I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, he can sell that tractor to my neighbor. He can sell that combine to my neighbor because I run red combines. Green tractors, green planter, green sprayer, but red combines. But, uh, so anyway, I have a defense now where I can 
I can save money. I can have a little bit better control, a tighter control over my budget, my fertilizer budget in particular. Um, and I don't think if it was... My brother said this in 2008 that uh, if it wasn't for Zachrix, he probably wouldn't be farming. And I know where we came from back here to where we're at today that I don't see how we would be farming today if it wasn't for investments in, in Xactrix um, and what it's done for us. So that's my story. Yeah. And I guess I, that's my mantra. It's always fun to talk bushels. But you can't take bushels to the bank. It's dollars that matter. So. Thanks, Ben. Gee.